But we begin tonight with the utterly dangerous words of an old man that could trigger, trigger World War III. Given the breathless coverage of Robert Hurd's report on not finding crimes to prosecute him for, you would think I was talking about President Joe Biden, but I'm not. I'm talking about Donald Trump. Though given the media's focus these days, I would understand the confusion. So here's the thing. It is the media's responsibility to cover both men with the same dogmatic fervor. But thus far, more ink has been spilled and more hours have been spent dissecting Joe Biden's age and mental fitness than time spent discussing the age and mental fitness of Donald Trump. Case in point, popular information tabulated the coverage of Trump's cognitive issues versus coverage of the Her report. And guess what got little attention? Trump. One network even asked if Biden's age, and I'll remind you, he's just three years older than Trump, is a bigger problem than Trump's indictments for stealing state secrets, lying to the feds about it, and, oh, inciting an insurrection. I guess creating a false equivalency between age and fascism is easier than talking about the latest incoherent fever dreams implanted in the mind of a septuagenarian retiree by his white nationalist aide, Stephen Miller, or maybe his ex-TV doppelganger and fellow Putin fan, Tucker Carlson. So in case you missed it, Here's a sampling of Trump's weekend ramblings. Rich people are given $7,000 subsidies. The danger from within is far greater, in my opinion, from the, than the danger on the outside. The fascists, the communists, the serious socialists. I hear that they like Obama better. They should like Obama better. You know why? Because he didn't ask for anything. We have to win in November. Or we're not going to have Pennsylvania. They'll change the name. They're going to change the name of Pennsylvania. We can be energy independent and we can even be energy dominant. And yes, quickly says that President Trump. Why, why would they change the name of Pennsylvania, man? Why would they do that? Who to what? Despite this man's clear mental deterioration, that right there is not the most terrifying aspect of what he said this weekend. No, no. What comes next? is what should make all of you stop and think real hard about the prospect of this man setting foot in the Oval Office ever again. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. Okay, did you hear that? That was Donald Trump telling his most fervent cult followers that like a below average mob boss, he could invite Vladimir Putin to invade a European country if that country didn't pay up siding with Russia over our treaty-bound NATO allies. Let's set aside the fact that he probably lied about the story. You know, he always says, sir, when he's making up a story. Let's set aside the fact that Europe actually does pay for its defense. And let's zero in on what is truly deranged and dangerous about what he said, which is his complete betrayal of our allies. The reason that it matters to us is because when we need help, one day when I don't know, Putin decides to retake Alaska, our allies might think twice about helping us. The comment was so dangerous that Rupert Murdoch's Wall Street Journal compared Trump to UK Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, who is best known for his policy of appeasement of Nazi Germany, as he allowed Hitler to take territory in Czechoslovakia in a failed effort to avoid a second world war. Allow me to make this crystal clear to everyone watching. What Trump did was invite a third world war in Europe by cheering on more aggression by Russia. In his latest column, Tom Nichols, staff writer for The Atlantic and a former professor of national security, asks why Donald Trump gets a pass for all of the deranged things he promotes. He writes, we should concentrate on the more terrifying problem. The leader of one of America's two major political parties has just signaled to the Kremlin that if elected, he would not only refuse to defend Europe, but he would gladly support Vladimir Putin during World War III and even encourage him to do as he pleases to America's allies. 
naturally because the Republican Party has been fully consumed by the MAGA movement and completely abandoned any vestige of their old ideology. Trump's comments were defended, dismissed, and legitimized by none other than serial flip-flopper Marco Rubio, senator in name only, from Florida. And I mean, he was talking about something, a story that he talked about happened in the past. He doesn't talk like a traditional politician. And uh, we've already been through this now. You'd think people had figured it out by now. I have zero concern. Oh, but he does talk like a, a traditional common fascist. But that, okay, that was just one of the many dangerous ideas that Trump promoted during just the past 72 hours. On Friday, he told a room full of gun lovers that he would roll back any gun safety measures Biden has taken while in office. This was after he reminded them that while he was in office, he proudly did nothing about gun violence. He also plans to round up 11 million migrants and force them into detention camps on U.S. soil, let federal officers shoot migrants, and allow police and even the military to shoot protesters on American streets, grant every police officer full immunity to kill at will, gut to the EPA and let oil companies drill anywhere they want, teach patriotic education in public schools, Mao Zedong style, ban abortion nationwide, terminate the Constitution, and start a war with Mexico because he wants to betray yet another ally. And those are just a few examples from a very long list of disturbing policy proposals Trump plans to enforce on day one. You know, the day he said he would be a dictator. Joining me now is William Taylor, former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and vice president for Russia and Europe for the United States Institute of Peace. And Tom Nichols, the aforementioned staff writer for The Atlantic. And Tom, I am going to start with you because I feel that we've reached the point where the media must dis diverge from this plan of equalizing Biden being an old man, which he can't do anything about because time is time and Donald Trump being thoroughly deranged. But I will allow you to talk. You know, it's one thing to cover both candidates in a political race. It's another to cover a candidate from a, a normal political party and uh, a presumptive nominee, um, because he's not the nominee yet, but he's on his way, um, who is literally saying things that, if anyone else said them, would be taken as evidence of severe emotional disorder of some kind. Uh, and that, I think, is, you know, you can't just simply say, well, we're going to cover one candidate and not the other. Um, but the fact that Trump says these things, it, it tells you, and that they're not just uh, covered as widely as they would be if someone else said them, suggests that Trump has just gotten us used to it. He's numbed us to it. He has firehosed us to it to accept as Senator Rubio shamefully just said, well, you know, it's just the way he talks. He doesn't talk like a normal politician. The problem is that he's aiming all of this, uh, Trump is aiming all of this at a domestic audience because he's terrified of not being elected because then he faces justice in multiple venues. But when he talks, the rest of the world is listening. They're taking notes. They are, they are absolutely uh, um, taking this as an indication of what he would do when he's in office. And so you know, what he's done is not only reckless and irresponsible, it's incredibly dangerous. And to stay with you for just a moment, Tom, I mean, the, the Marco Rubio, by the way, who used to call Donald Trump dangerous when he was running against him in 2016. And he still, I believe, believes that he's just saying whatever at this point, like the rest of the cowards right in the party. The, the way that people get away with saying Trump's not so bad is they're like, well, he already served. He was already president and he didn't do X, Y or Z. But can you just speak to the further degradation of the dignity and spines of Republicans? Because I can't think of any who would stop him if he decided to pull out of NATO this time. They're more cowardly than they were before. They're more cowed and they're more focused because they're like, when he gets in, we can get rid of Medicare. We can privatize Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security. So we don't care what he does. Do, can you name two of them who'd stop him if he said he was getting out of NATO? Because I can't. No, and it's utterly fallacious to say, well, because he didn't do this the first time around, he won't do it the second time around. Uh, there were a lot of reasons he didn't do these things the first time around, in part um, because he didn't know how to, and the people hmm. around him didn't know how to, um, and because there still were responsible people around him who were simply not going to go along with these kinds of um, harebrained schemes. 
Um, this time around, there won't be anybody to stop him. And as we, as you point out, as we just saw, um, what Republican politicians, what elected Republican politicians want to do is keep their jobs and stay in Washington, because the only people they fear as much as Donald Trump are their own constituents. They don't want to go home. They don't want to be around the people that elected them. And that means they'll do anything to stay in Washington. If that means um, agreeing with Donald Trump when he threatens to destabilize the, the, the peace and security of the entire planet, well, you know, so be it. That That's how you get to stay in Washington, I guess. Correct. Uh, they think that they'll survive it. They figure they'll be okay. They've got money. And back Two Israeli hostages are free and reunited with their families after they were rescued early Monday. Israeli forces say they rescued the two hostages, Fernando Marman and Luis Har, who were being held by Hamas in the city of Rafah. The human cost, however, was massive. Local officials said the airstrikes used in the raid killed more than 60 Palestinians, including women and children. Rafah is a crowded city, sheltering more than one million displaced people. According to NBC News reporting, President Biden has been venting his frustration in recent private conversations over his inability to persuade Israel to change its military tactics in the Gaza Strip, even calling Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu an a-hole, according to people directly familiar with his comments. But as Biden disparages Netanyahu in private, not much has significantly changed in terms of U.S. policy toward Israel and Gaza, even as the death count soars. More than 28,000 people have been killed in Gaza since the war began, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. Thousands more are missing and presumed dead. Joining me now is Rula Jabril, a Palestinian policy expert and visiting professor at the University of Miami. Rula, my friend, it is great to see you. Let's talk about this. There is a dichotomy now between what President Biden is saying privately and publicly. And also the policy hasn't changed much. Well, if you say things privately and then your policies are unwilling, you're unwilling to change your policy, it means nothing. I mean, look at the frustration of uh, the European chief diplomat, Borrell, who is a very moderate guy who today came. If you really believe, and this was pointed out to President Biden, if you believe that they are killing too many people, they are going over the top, then... Ultimately, you have to cut military aid. You have to stop military aid. I mean, for Borrell to say that, it indicates that the Europeans are shifting. Uh, already you have the Netherlands, Spain, Belgium. They already are not sending weapons. You're already seeing a shift in Europe where they're saying we distance them ourselves from these kind of policies. They're unwilling to stand with Bibi Netanyahu. What they consider is zero-sum genocidal policies. And it's jeopardizing national security for them, for Europeans, for the Israelis themselves, and for the Americans. And, you know, the, the, the ostensive reason for this is to return the, I think, about 130 hostages remaining. But the ratio, you know, two hostages freed for 60 Palestinians, but it's much more than that because of the missing and dead. Over the weekend, the story of a little girl named Hind, a, yes. a beautiful little six-year-old girl, who the 911 call to the Red Crescent went around the world. These are the kinds of stories we're seeing. Her body was found. She was found dead uh, in the vehicle in which she was fleeing, trying to get to safety. This is the, these are the stories that people are seeing. This is what's impacting the, the, 12, the attitude toward the war. 12,000 children in the course of four months been killed. We know that children are dying now as we speak of starvation. The use of starvation as a weapon of war is illegal. The story of Hind is the story of many people, but we heard Hind begging for mercy, begging for help on a phone call. And Joy, you talk about the hostages. Ultimately, they free two hostages. But 30 were killed by Israeli bombardment. The only time we had any hostage release is by negotiation. Yeah. There's a, no military solution to this conflict. There's only a diplomatic one. And what Netanyahu is doing, he's bragging that he is fighting with Biden because he benefited from that politically. But he's expanding the war to the West Bank while all eyes on Gaza, on Rafa, on the onslaught, on the slaughter of Rafa. What's happening in the West Bank tonight? They burned down a village, Hawara, an entire village, the village that a finance minister was calling to wipe it out. We see in Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem, in my neighborhood, under my neighborhood, hundreds chanting of extremist Jewish uh, settlers saying, kill all the Arabs. Sadly, if the United States doesn't intervene to stop this mass killing of Palestinians, what the world consider as Bibi Netanyahu's policy of extermination of Palestinians, President Biden has a responsibility to protect. And he's not only doing anything, he actually seems to be, you know, privately venting, 
but unwilling and unable to do anything. I mean, today he had a conversation in the White House with some, some people from the regions, and the only thing he was focused on, the people from the region, is let's, let's wait and see what happened after, and maybe we can have desalination projects for Gaza. But by the time the war ends, I think there will be a thinning of the population, as Israel predicted, and people will be, there will be no Gaza. The living conditions don't exist there anymore. And Rafa is the, la the last station, the last place. And if you are willing to not protect the civilians, which, you know, after Rwanda, the United States developed this doctrine. Yeah. Our responsibility to protect the United States is compelled to protect civilians. And if he's unwilling to do that, I fear this will open the door, not only for Netanyahu to erase Palestinians, for Trump to win here and for Putin to take not only Ukraine, and take Europe as well. And that is, that's the wider picture, yes. right? And, and the, the other thing that you're now seeing is an emboldening. And, I, and the yes. ICJ slowed, I think, folks down for a moment. But now I'm thinking some VO of it. People are literally blockading the aid from getting into Gaza yes. and amassing themselves near the, near the border with Egypt and saying, we're not letting any food get in. Settlers not only blockading the aid, settlers are, are now chanting in every city, including inside Israel, kill all the Palestinians, kill the Arabs, exterminate them. I mean, I never seen in, you know, in my lifetime, uh, soldiers uploading their own pictures, yeah. committing war crimes. We're living in a, in a situation where not only Palestinians yeah. are streaming the atrocity yeah. they are being subjected, we're seeing actually Israeli soldiers Posting bragging about that. On social this, media. Yeah. This comes from one thing. Yeah. Lack of accountability, Indeed. a sense of impunity, but above all, unconditional support and lack from of scrutiny. The from in the, the media States. of these policies. Yeah. And that's why they feel emboldened. Uh, Rula Jabril, thank you. Yeah. Uh, an expert in the region and I always value your voice. Thank you so much. And